Good evening. Welcome to Conspiracy Cafe. I'm your host, George Freund. We're with you now. We're with you to the end. We always try to put that end off just a little longer than normal if we can, and we're hoping we can do that again as well. We're still in uh, tight negotiations here with that channel about next year, so maybe we'll even be back next year here at the one and only that channel. We'll see how things fly in the new year, but after this show, I'm going to need a good long rest just to uh, chill out and demystify. We'll still be active on our website, conspiracy hyphen cafe.com or dash if you wish and keep posting videos and news and views because usually as we get into the solstice season the new world order is always up to some kind of tricks like last year when they were smuggling missiles on a ship taking it across the shiny seas to get it into a war zone in the Mediterranean to start that one and only World War III and barbecue your souls but we follow them in fact, we were probably the only media following them, except maybe the Russian Navy. I think they were following them, too. And that's why we reported the CEO of the shipping company actually getting in touch with me to ask, do you know where my boat is? Because that's how big a difference we can make. It's like we said in the last show about the swimming pools. You can have two swimming pools of chemicals that just lie there. You can even mix them, and maybe they bubble a little bit. But when you add the catalyst... They explode. They leave one big wop ass hole in the ground. We're the catalyst. We make them shiver. We make them shit their pants. Because we get in at the highest levels. Because we're able to see things that nobody else can see. That no one else can even speculate that they can see. And we do it with complete faith that we're on the right track and on the right trail. There's a lot of more popular shows. But we have to wonder what kind of techniques they're using. I was listening to Alex Jones a couple of days ago on my day off, and he was talking about, you know, how some woman from California came and tapped the hood of his car, or truck actually, and started to yell at him or something like that. That's just typical talk radio fare. The let's talk about driving crap. So you can listen to any moronic talk show in the lower 48 or here in the uh, upper 10 in Canada, and that's, oh yeah, that guy cut me off, man. And you just, you know, you go down to the level of wrestling. So how much time did he waste on that? A lot. Okay. Quick story, get the news out, and then get into the news, the real news, the real views. I could have taken that 40 minutes and maybe got out 12, 15 stories that are very pertinent, very important to your life, but whether you have breathing privileges or not. So you have to wonder why degenerate to the quality of wrestling. Because they don't want you to know anything. Is that controlled opposition or not? It's difficult to say. But it's a lot of time wasted on pretty much next to nothing. So that's one of the discerning factors you have to use to decide how your mind is programmed. Your mind is programmed. It's up to you, because I don't know you all, to be the deprogrammer. I used to do that a lot, so I'm very familiar with how they're programmed and how you're deprogrammed found this cute little video in the supermarket, Hollywood. Excellent. Wish I could find a, you know, a copy on the internet to post on the website, uh, and unfortunately, I can't. But I'll tell you, it takes a lot to really get me interested in something. This one is just like non-stop. This is how the system works. So they get into how Hollywood controls the news and the politics. And everything you have is an illusion or a dream of a story maybe they told you a long time ago that you vote for something and you live in a free country. And it gets into the marketing techniques that they use and what the news really is. And they don't, they don't lie about it. They just flat out come and tell you. When they're doing the news and they say a big word, you know, like big birds got to come out the back. Big word, big word, big word, run, 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 big word. And they do run. They change the channel. They change the channel from the news to the idiot channels. Or as they said in the video, instantly they go from, you know, CNN, CBS, NBC to Jeopardy. And they watch the ratings by the minute to see, you know, when you flush the toilet, when you bite a sandwich. And now they have the Samsung cameras in your TV set, so they can know that right down to the millisecond. When you sneeze, when you fart, what you eat. And they realize when they lose their audience. And if they tell you the truth, the bimbos change the channel. 
and go down the evolutionary scale significantly. And that's why they lie to you. They're not interested in the news. You know what they're really interested in, what they find out? They're interested in what you wear. So I could tell you the truth, which I will get into, about you know how we have to really thank our hacktivists for saving the last election because they tried to use the same trick to steal all the votes in Ohio, the Republican Party, that is. And Anonymous set up traps for the Republicans. They hacked all their stuff, got all their passwords, and were waiting for them, as George always says. They headed them off at the pass because they know they had to take the data from Ohio, reroute it down to, I believe it's Tennessee, to a company that's owned by a Republican sympathizer. And just when they have this terrible data problem, these guys come to the rescue. That's not news. So people are, they don't care. You went to the machine, sh sh you pushed your button, and like I used to say for years, it doesn't matter what button you push, you voted for Bush. You think you voted, you go home, you're happy, straight to jeopardy. Someone brings up something complex like Hollywood or the fact that these voting machines are crooked. Uh, or like that old cartoon character, buzz, click, buzz, click, this does not compute, this does not compute, buzz, click, buzz, click. And they rule the world until you catch on. You look at the video of General Stubblebine that we have posted in our video section talking about how he woke up to 9-11. Career military man. Expert in intelligence, tactics, techniques. And then he realized this was the hardest thing to swallow is that he was working for the beast. And when he figured it out, then all the pieces started to line up, those little dots. You can darn your socks and put all the dots in a row too. They all lined up and then he realized this was a massive inside job. There's no other explanation. And he lays it all out in a very comfortable manner. You were had. What are you going to do about it? Change the channel, but don't go to Jeopardy. You go to Conspiracy Cafe, you come to that channel, you go to a source that's going to take the bull by the horns and twist it down into the ground. Maybe if Hugh has something to do for a Christmas project or something like that, he should get us a, uh, you know, a big screen somewhere where we can have our, uh, you know, Whip the Bastard of the Week award or something like that. We get out a big bull whip and put up the, the top criminal of the week and just lash him a few times. The whipping of the week. Probably be good for ratings. But then you get the point across, too, to say, these scum dogs are cheating us out of everything. When we look at the money, and we get into the derivative story on how much, like in, like, you know, bills and stuff like that, that you actually are responsible for when this derivative things crash. The World Trade Center could be made out of $100 bills, both towers, and that just covers one bank. $100 bills, even three times the gross domestic product of the planet Earth. There'll be nothing like it. But people aren't preparing. Even Her Majesty's getting ready. She's no fool. She's lived through this stuff before. Actually, maybe we can even look quickly at Her Majesty. You don't see this too often. You won't see it in the United States, that's for sure. Let's get our little pictures loaded here. Takes a lot of juice to run this. See, she had to go check something out. She went to the Bank of England to count the little gold bars. See, just like a squirrel. Really got them laid in there. Hey, yeah, pick them up, make sure they're not, uh, what is it, titanium or something like that they were using as a, as a copy. See, that's all mine. You dirty rats. And then, you, you know, she waves, we give her flowers. He smiles and says, hmm, I'm still wearing my pampers. All the boys line up and bless Her Majesty. And then she does something really cool. Here we go. So you can create your own money. So the Queen just wrote this. A one million pound, one of a kind banknote signed by Her Majesty. Payer to, payable to the bearer on demand, the sum of one million pounds. Just like that. 
right out of thin air. Just get a piece of paper and all that nice scratchy writing stuff and there you go, one million pounds. So, and of course we can't trust her too much so she just gets the gingerbread houses. They don't let her in the big vault. You never know, she's the other woman, right? But look at all the money. She, we can't find out what's in the Fed. Nobody tells us what's in Fort Knox. You don't see the president going through doing a photo op like this. This is very important. She's telling the world we got our gold. Probably got your gold too. So when it happens, Britain's got something to fall back on. What America's got, well, that's up in the air until they open the doors at the last minute. And then they might be in for a big surprise. And maybe down in Paraguay, Mr. Bush will roll an El Producto cigar and chuckle a couple of times and go, Them fools. <laughs> yeah. But that's what it's all about. That's the real money, the real De Niro's. And the Queen's got her share and she's telling the world. At a very appropriate time, January 1st, that becomes Class A money under Basel III. You can borrow 100% on the value of gold. Goes from Tier 3 to Tier 1. That'll be the most valuable money in the world, January 1st. Happy New Year. So who's going to tell you stuff like that? Oh, I will. At least then you can be prepared. I don't try to find out what everything is and just use it for myself. We have a big Google Doodle. They take their time on that because, you know, they don't like what we write. They don't like it at all. But it is so apropos, it's almost scary. So this is the December 10th Google Doodle. The one for Ada Lovelace, mathematician, the woman who's supposed to have devised the, uh, the first algorithm to be used for computer programming. Very brilliant woman. But what we see in this doodle are things that no one would ever see because, you know, like say I started monkeying around in my own basement doing videos for, you know, to show and to tell you things and all that. I got a chair that looks just like that and a little table my grandmother left me is exactly the same thing. And then they got their little blurb there, TV, 2 equals TV2, TV3 equals TV3. Almost, you know, it's like a mirror image of things. It's not really high-end math, but they're just telling you that, you know, it is a quantum universe. One thing is on one side and the other side at the same time. Sometimes on neither side, sometimes on both sides at the same time. One of the big things about the twilight language, and we illustrate it very well, with a vortex. When you see my car drive down the highway, you don't see the air ray displace. Doesn't mean it's not there, it just means you can't see it. When the plane takes off, you don't see the vortex like that. Unless it's stirring up some other particles that are visible to you. You may see little tufts of wind or something like that, but you don't see the, uh, the you know, this. A lot of times on the highway traveling in the winter, you see a transport truck coming down the road, and you'll see the vortex because it stirs up the snowflakes especially powdered snow, and you get this mountain of snow coming at you. Could totally can completely blind you. You can be passed at high speed, you know, any other time. It's just air molecules. You never see them. You feel the wind pushes you, but you never see the vortex. Doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you couldn't see it. And that's like that about the twilight language. Can you communicate without leaving a trail, even if you don't want to? The answer is probably no. Every thought, every idea is going to leave some kind of a trail. We only understand the dimensions we live in, a three-dimensional world. There are other dimensions that's been scientifically proven and it is an established fact. Anything in a fourth, fifth, sixth, or higher dimension has complete mastery of us, just like we have mastery over the second dimension or the first dimension because we're in the third. Can signs or trails be left? I'd have to say that, yes, they can. The hard part is, is to open your mind to see them. The algorithm is another means of using mathematics to probably look beyond what we can see, hear, and understand. And that's why they use it in, you know, virtual gambling, like the derivatives market. This is a picture of something like TV2 equals... TV3, 
This is the Fermi bubble in the Milky Way galaxy. 25,000 light years from center to edge, 50,000 light years for both, but it's a mirror image, a quantum of this gamma radiation. So a lot of people say, you know, just as a joke, you know, if something was really going on, God would give us a sign. Give us a sign. Tell us. And as I was laughing at a, you know, a short wave show that I was listening to about uh, a chap using an old movie with uh, Lily Tomlin or something. She's a ghost. She's got this guy she loves. He dies. You know, she's in wherever looking down on him and all. And he gets hooked up with the blonde bomber. And, you know, the chick's just taking him for everything he's got. And, you know, she can't really do anything because she's a ghost. But a good poltergeist ghost. But he realizes, you know, well, maybe this is a, a tough part. You know, what if this girl really isn't so good for me and all that? So he asks Lily Tomlin and, you know, wherever she is as a ghost, give me a sign, give me a sign. The pictures are rattling on the wall, falling off, glasses are crashing, and he's still yelling out, give me a sign, give me a sign. He's got all the signs. He just blew all the stop signs. So maybe we have a sign. In Ada's life, she's the daughter of poet Lord Byron, who died in Greece. Well, that's a bit of a sign, because Greece is where it's happening for the economic collapse. He actually fought in Greece. And what are we doing still, fighting in Greece, to get rid of the banksters and gangsters that are holding us to economic ransom? The 21st of April was a deed of separation between mother and father. And then he died in the fighting on April the 19th. And I think we remember that April the 20th is a big power date in the middle. So it's just boxed in there nice. A lot of things happen around April the 20th, like school massacres, certain Fuhrer's birthdays, and things like that. So they're boxing something in. They're telling us something, even though they don't want to tell us something. Maybe they don't even know what they want to tell us. Ada's grandmother raised her. Her name was Millbank. Well, simple translation for that is a thousand banks. As I speak today, the European Currency Board just established regulations to control 6,000 banks in Europe. Millbank. One of her mentors, teachers, tutors, was a fellow named William Friend, which is a version of Friend, which is a version of my name. And this William's father was named George. Rather, Tudor was William King. And King William, future King William, is always in the news too. So that sort of just pops out. She was a very intelligent woman, tried to derive how brain processes work, how nerve feelings work. She married this William King, had three children. She became uh, the wife of the Earl of Lovelace when he got his title. She had lots of gambling problems and lost heavily. Well, what are the markets? Nothing but a big global casino. Where we stand to lose a thing too. Lots of things. She had issues with a man named Cross, and a lot of us are going to have issues with the man who was nailed on the cross. Her translation of Luigi Menabrea's paper on the Babbage Analytical Engine won her acclaim. There's controversy about her work. She died at 36, three sixes, 666, six, six, on November 27th. And they write it specifically 27 November, 9-11, of cancer. The other bizarre thing about the vortex is it takes us in a bizarre direction, but we can't argue with uh, what's before our eyes. The popular porn film, Deep Throat, Linda Lovelace. A one-hit wonder. That's not really important. That's neither here nor there, as we can say in quantum physics, perhaps. But the big name is Deep Throat. Deep Throat comes from the Nixon era. The guy who spills the beans, tells the reporters what's going on. And things are going on. There's still people spilling beans. One of the big ones today, of course, is... Paulo Gabriel, the Pope's butler, he spilled the beans. He was a deep throat in the Vatican. Back in the day, the man whose paper she was decoding, Luigi Menabrea, he was prime minister of Italy. They fought the papal states. There was a war. 
against them. He had to kind of put things back together, get into secret negotiations with Napoleon III and Victor Emmanuel. And then the new guy who takes over in the Vatican, Monsignor George Gonswin, Ratzinger's old aide-de-camp for many long years, is basically the power behind the throne. They made a movie about Linda Lovelace, just came out. It's called Inferno. When we do a lot of these Google doodles, we find out a lot of things about Infernos, like Dante's Inferno was a major, major, major piece of a previous Google doodle as we descend into hell. The name is there again. The code for the U.S. military, for their computer language, is called ADA. Mill Standard 1815. Is there a deep throat, someone inside, releasing information about the inferno that is to come? And then one of the pieces I just happened to be working on while going through this for whatever timely matter, I come across this guy's book, very well written material, The Most Dangerous Book on Earth, 9-11 as a Mass Ritual by S.K. Bain. Never heard of it before. It's very in-depth. There's a link to an article on it where you can read his philosophies and understandings on how this was a mass sacrifice from beginning to end. He understands it probably like no one I've ever come across. And then just as an aside, he says they're going to nuke Phoenix on Christmas Day. Not that that's important. See, I might not have the right tie on for nuking Phoenix, so you probably changed to Jeopardy. So what deep throat spilled the beans to this guy to tell him what they're going to do? It's like the world's a conspiracy. Got these guys in the little bunker underground. They're going to nuke Phoenix. The world is a stage. Shakespeare, or whoever he was, said that a long time ago. Every actor pay, plays his part in the illusion. It's very important for you to see it for what it is and what it isn't. Changing the channel changes the programming, which changes the outcome. So we'll see you there on the flip side. A very wise thing to do. I won't have too much time to go into uh, the article, but let's say there's a link there, how globalists write the script and what can be done to change the, cho the ch story, or in my philosophy, the channel. They traumatize us into cooperating with what they want us to do so that we willingly say, you know, do me, do me. They love it when you beg for it. They really do. So that's why it is so important. This is the flip side, the sign of the times, the Fermi bubble. It's absolutely amazing. Like as soon as you see that picture, you can't help but just go, wow. You know, if that's our sun, you know, and then we blow that up a zillion times, then maybe we can see our planet and blow that up a zillion times, and maybe you can see, uh, you know, Toronto and where we're broadcasting here. But it just gives you some perspective of the size of the universe. This is the thing in a more active phase, probably in the past, or maybe it'll be in the future, because what is time? Is this part of the black hole that eats and consumes? But I was immediately struck by the fact that you look at this gaseous cloud type of thing, and this is the bubble that you see immediately after a nuclear explosion. This vast plasma. Very interesting stuff. Very interesting times. And the beauty of it is you get to participate a little bit and find out some of these things because we make that happen. They have big plans for us. Big plans. We're probably one of the few shows that started to talk about singularity and our good friendy friend here, Ernie. The Terminator, the ultimate weapon for global domination. You see the ultimate plan of the Singularity Project to make the most intelligent humanoid type computer so advanced, so powerful, that it supersedes human beings as a form of life, where you'll have no more importance than an amoeba in this form of life that is now superior. The ultimate form of life on the planet Earth can do whatever it wants to you herd you, consume you, destroy you, just like 
like you would do with any other lower form of life. And then we take that classic old song and add that to this blog because it just fits in. Come gather round people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. It's your time to you is worth saving. Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone. For the times they are changing. And they are changing at lightning speed. The world moves at the speed of the predator and in this case the terminator. And you can't catch up. This isn't like an illustration. This is a laboratory. They're building these things with DARPA, Singularity University, part of the Ames Research Facility. They actually want to put your psyche inside a robot so that you can have eternal life. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen and keep your eyes wide the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon for the wheel's still in spin and there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will later to win for the times they are a-changing. And Arnie, there's Arnie's dad, Gustav. Gustav was a good German. He fought in the war against us. But one of the little important things about Arnie was his middle name, Alois. Because you couldn't call him Adolf. You know, just after the war, that would kind of stick out a little bit. But that's Hitler's father's name. And there's Arnie, front page of Time magazine, with that nice little belt buckle there. The skull and bones. The top of the SS uniform. Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it is raging. I'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls for the times they are a-changing. And that's just what Lily Tomlin did to her husband for. She got suckered in by the blonde chick. She shook and rattled the walls. This is one of the robot projects in Japan that they're preparing for. In between two ages, a big new Brzezinski wrote about the technotronic era where they'll use technology. The global elite will rule the world. They have two tactics. Technotronic era generally implies an espionage state where everything is recorded and monitored. Fake terror attacks have always worked well. Nazis did the fake Reichstag fire. It's an old trick. The elite magicians don't teach us their tricks. You have to learn them yourself. The other facet is the advance of the robot as a killing machine. In the future, our Terminator, Kuratos, here, was featured at a Japanese robotic show. He has two Gatling guns mounted in his hands there to uh, blow you away. Actually, it's he, a woman sits in here to control him at this point in time until they can put Singularity together and give him a conscience of some sort or another. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend a hand for the times they are a-changing. And it's old stuff. Will Brenner taught us about this kind of stuff in his movie Westworld. He was a Terminator. A lot of you are probably too young to have known about that one, but it's around, available. Maybe I can find an old copy to put on the website. Quite a thing as the, the, the robot takes over and just starts wasting the people who thought they were playing a game. It's the art of war. You sleep, they take over. There's a software program called Mind's Eye. It uses algorithms like AdamAge to predict the actions of those monitored in the surveillance grid. That was featured in the film Minority Report. So they catch you on video, look at how you move, and then anticipate what you're going to do. This is the surveillance grid spying on us. They've come up with thought reading devices that they're working on. Schools want to put RFID chips in their students. It's just a stepping stone to the Mark of the Beast system. These beasts will be robots that will crack the whip. And they won't need us slaves anymore because the robot can work 24-7 and never tire and do the work of 10 men. 
They won't need the police and the military anymore either because these robots will be the ultimate killing machine and they'll work for free. They'll probably even make the robot sex slaves. That's probably the big uh, pressing item in Japan. So what should the kids do when they introduce all these microchips? They should be lining up for their Second Amendment marches at school and just say, nuts to you. One of the big reasons they probably greased CIA director Petraeus is he talked about this surveillance grid. Made no bones about it. I, I did it here a year before he talked about it just to say, well, how come your, uh, you know, all your TV stuff's using so much hydro? Like it's going 24-7, uses more electricity than your air conditioner. That's not TV. That's not your DVR. That thing's spying on you. And then he came out a year later and admitted it. They are spying on you. Your TV is watching you. And all your electric gadgets, they can be turned on any time, any place where you have them, and they can monitor you. He said it was the ultimate treasure trove for the intelligence agencies. This is so dangerous that Cambridge has even opened a Terminator Center to study the unpleasant, the British are so good at that, the unpleasant, if not dangerous, aspects of this technology. They believe there'll be a point in time where there's a Pandora's box moment. One of the bizarre things is uh, we do talk about some of the people that end up in this article. One is a fellow named John Jack Good, who was a friend of Alan Turing. We talked about him in the codes. He's the guy who worked at Bletchley Park as a code master. This chap wrote way back in 1965 about these things. He also advised Stanley Kubrick in the 2001 film project. And as you look at Kubrick's Odyssey in our video section, about what they did to him and how he faked the moon landing, make no surprise about it. You see, one day you won't be able to tell the difference between what they make and what you are, or even if they replace you. They're getting pretty good at it. And there's a lot of the guys who just fall sucker for the pretty face, even with all the warnings of the picture shaken on the wall. The line is drawn, the curse is cast. The slow one now will later be last. As the present now will later be past, the order is rapidly fading. And the first one now will later be last, for the times they are a-changing. And you got to keep up. What's that old saying, sink or swim? And how do they, uh, you know, work on uh, on us? U of T has a has a great setup here. The smiley face microchip, little Thomas the Tank Engine. So we can put this on your skin as a tattoo and hide all the electric and electronic gizmos that we're going to stick in your body. See, we have all this new technology, and he's got cute little eyes and little connection points here on the side. And you can have your Thomas the Tank Engine, Mark of the Beast. It's absolutely brilliant. They waste nothing. There's deeper, broader aspects to this technology. They are really up to no good. The U.S. is collecting the DNA of world leaders. So in this article, which is quite good, they talk about this in a, in a broader, specific concept that's probably been used in many assassinations. By having your DNA, making a genetic blueprint, they can personally create a special bioweapon that can kill you and you alone by looking after just certain facets of your DNA and wiping you out. So in this author's blurb, he comes up with a, you know, a fictional story perhaps of how this would work. It's taken very seriously. The president has a special detail that goes around and collects his DNA wherever he goes. So it can be washed, scrubbed, or burned so that nobody can get their hands on it. From my perspective, the most dangerous aspect of technology like this is that they make a clone. And the clone is a replacement for whatever leader they want, whether it's a bankster, a gangster, a general, a head of intelligence, you just replace him. And no one will ever know the difference because your fingerprints are the same, your retina is the, the same, 
It's just you've been made in Manchuria to do whatever needs to be done. And you'd never know. In this article, they say that by modern technology and the fact that they crowdsource a lot of technology, research, development, design can be reduced greatly in price. And that there could be a day where someone could crowdsource out to get the designer virus that he needs, deliver it to a location. In this, they use a university campus where the president's going to speak. They deliver it to a student who isn't under tight security, who will have access to the general vicinity of where the president's going to come. The student gets sick. A lot of the students get sick, but it's not their genetic specific DNA virus. So it means nothing. You just sniffle and sneeze a little bit, but eh, you get by. You've had worse. But this virus was designed to kill the president. He picks it up. He takes it home. A couple of days later, <coughs> he croaks. And nobody even knows what happened. So they forecast a lot of this stuff into the future. They use algorithms to do a lot of the work, as Ada did. They talk about the expense of doing the Genome Project and how expensive it was at the beginning, how it cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and how it's been gradually reduced and reduced and reduced because Moore's Law applies to a lot of technology, not just the computer technology. One of the other little, like, wooden stakes in the heart here is in 2010, in the WikiLeaks, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton directed our embassies to surreptitiously collect, that's U.S. embassies, DNA samples from foreign heads of state and senior United Nations officials. So when you go to the White House, there's a cleanup crew coming in after you for whatever purpose they may have. So now you see why they go after this Julian Assange so much. He revealed a lot of good stuff. But, you know, somehow I don't recall seeing that one in the newspaper on the front page or... You know, it, it's kind of like a good door opener there on CNN, or, you know, you get that, uh, what's his name, guy who does that 360 show or something, you know. Well, I, uh, maybe I'll go 361, you know, hey, look at this one. They could do a lot with that one. So a lot of the techniques are the same techniques they use for making cancer drugs. And these cancer drugs, this is a little side benefit from this article, come from chemical warfare agents. So they find out what kills you, they call it like carpet bombing. So it just whaps out all your cells and they just hope, you know, you, they kill the cancer cells before you croak. They try to do it, you know, a little better with collateral damage and all. But as they work on this stuff, they can perfect it and refine it, perfect it and refine it. One of the pop sides is there's a Finnish company that's doing this kind of treatment to specifically target specific cancer cells in specific individuals. The company's called Oncos Therapeutics. So they're well on the way. That's a good thing. The bad thing is a state-sponsored program of the Stuxnet variety may be able to accomplish using it as a personalized bioweapon. You'll tell people about that, and their eyes will go glassy, and they go, Sounds like science fiction, but it's not. In 1965, Gordon Moore wrote, developed, and worked on integrated circuit components and computers. And he said that roughly every year, there'd be a doubling of the power capacity of these integrated circuits since the 50s. They called it Moore's Law. Every 12 months, now they've revised that to 24 months, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit will double. That's exponential growth. In the 1970s, the supercomputer in the world was a cray. It filled a small room. It cost eight million dollars. Today your iPhone is a hundred times faster and twelve thousand times cheaper. And that's probably not taking into account inflation. Moore's observation, the pattern of exponential growth, occurs in many other industries and technologies. Internet traffic data, bytes of computer storage data, 
available per dollar, digital camera pixels per dollar, data transferable over fiber optic cable, and they're getting to the good stuff, genetics. The four letters of the genetic alphabet, A, C, G, and T, can be transformed into the ones and zeros of binary code, allowing for the easy electronic manipulation of genetic information. Biology is morphing into an information-based science and advancing exponentially. The dangers are bizarre. In the future, politicians, celebrities, leaders of industry, just about anyone could be vulnerable to attack by disease, which would go undetected, mistaken for death by natural causes. And then they have an entirely new kind of personal warfare, inducing extreme paranoia. In the article, they mention the CEO of a large corporation. They'd use it to infect you, to induce you to shop. But of course, as I'll be doing in a blog probably tomorrow as I update my bothersome bodies, a very influential banker took one of those big dives in Hong Kong. Very interesting days. The times, they are a-changing. They asked Bill Gates about stuff like that. He told a reporter that if he were a kid today, forget about hacking computers, I'd be hacking biology. And of course, they're behind the big singularity project. The world is changing at warp speed. You better get on board. Louisiana, Louisiana town was evacuated after six million pounds of explosives were found near that sinkhole. You gotta wonder like why they're storing so much stuff there. I say they're blowing a lot of that stuff. They're gonna try to blow a lot of that stuff on the fault line on purpose. Just they got caught. Lucky for us. Very lucky for us. Lots of stuff going to be happening in the Middle East, Damascus specifically. It's amazing how sometimes an image leads you. You found this image first, and then all the information to follow. It's kind of cute. I like that too, that old song, sitting on the dock of the bay, watching Damascus blow away. But uh, that's just something borrowed from a pop song too. We got the original lyrics there if you're really interested. But our leaders keep taking us closer and closer to the abyss of war because we don't exercise the right of true citizens and demand control of the ship of state. The fiscal cliff is bad enough, but this fiscal cliff, this cliff is just a sheer cliff of our very existence. Vacillating in whatever mundane diversions they have allowed us will achieve nothing save and accept our enslavement or destruction. We are the masters of our destiny. We always have been. However, we have grown lazy and awkward. We must spread our wings out and fly. Not off a building after you're induced with extreme paranoia. We always have been taken advantage of. It's time we see the true path and embrace it. Part of the new path is changing the channel, changing the paradigm, changing the outcome, changing the program. We will always shout it from the rooftop what's brewing off Syria in this article is, you know, U.S. and Dutch NATO troops massing on the Turkey-Syrian border with Patriot missiles, Germany sending troops, the Netherlands. That's the uh, Patriot missile battery there, so at least you can have a, you know, a Reader's Digest uh, version of how that puppy works. Then they come up with the bullshit about the chemical weapons they're going to cross, you know, Washington's red line. And it would be, it's all made up. They never used it. Another author was in Syria when even Daddy Assad, who was far more ruthless, was going wild. They said the same thing then, back in 82. He said, I was there. There was nothing for chemical weapons. If they're going to use or deploy chemical weapons, you would see gas masks with the soldiers. If they ever did use it, you know, you'd detect these sickly sweet odors. Nothing. No one reported anything. It was never used. And it's never going to be used here. They just made it up so that they can have a causus belli, a reason to go into war, claiming 
that they're saving it. If any chemical weapons were released, they'd probably come out of U.S. inventory and they'd just blame it on him. This is a nice picture of our aircraft carrier uh, off the coast, the USS Eisenhower, taken November the 19th. But I just, you know, it's just a little better or different than the other ones with the lightning strike. Part of the other ships in the uh, contingents. USS Iwo Jima, the USS New York, the USS Gunston Hall, 2,500 Marines. The USS New York is made from scrap metal from the World Trade Center. So far, there's 17 warships, 70 fighter bombers, 10,000 military personnel, the Air Force's 39th Air Base Wing. Thousands of U.S. ground troops are available from Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain. The European Union Border Assistance Mission is on Egypt's Rafa border. A full-scale military intervention would require about 75,000 U.S. troops. They haven't gone that far yet, but France is sending in special forces to do the same thing they did in Libya. And it looks like they're kind of almost winning there. So all these nations, U.S., France, Britain, Turkey, Jordan, and other anti-Assad Arab states like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar, are getting ready to take care of business. The French have sent their aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle, it's joined the Eisenhower Strike Force, five British warships carrying a large marine force. They've been doing practice landings in uh, Albania on the coast because it's very similar to the shores they'll be storming. These are the agents of change. They're probably not, uh, not specifically, but, you know, same kind of guys, bunch of mercenaries or thugs with AKs, all bandaged up. Hillary Clinton said... Uh, she was going to meet with the Russians to try to get some kind of breakthrough. She got sick. She wasn't able to go to the Marrakesh meeting unless she got better fast. You know, you take oregano oil, stops that draining out the rear end real fast here. But you learn that with age. you got a little few more years to go, I guess. So we have, uh, we have our troubles. There's a lot of talk from the Russians about, you know, working with Turkey to figure things out, but they won't allow any foreign influence. So does that mean... NATO and Russia are going to square off. It's hard and to say. Assistance. Confident it's that still with your help, Hillary is very quick to point out things that we discussed on be. this show. Free she and independent. Politics for better. But she says that Russia and Central Asia and Eastern Europe are using a ruse of economic integration to put back the old Soviet Union. There is a move, she says, quote, to re-Sovietize the region. It's going to be called a customs union. But let's make no mistake about it. We know what the goal is, and we're trying to figure out effective ways to slow down or prevent it. And I guess one of the effective ways would be sooner or later they're going to come head to head. This is an old picture of uh, Paul on the road to Damascus. Damascus is very well talked about in the Bible, Isaiah 17. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. We have the tools to make these things ruinous heaps. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. But the harvest shall be a heap in the day of Greece, grief and desperate sorrow. Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chafe of the mountains before the wind, and the rolling thing might be the whirlwind, the vortex. And behold, an evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and a lot of them that rob us. And there's a lot of them that rob us. They're called banksters, banksters and gangsters. The world's trees are dying alarmingly fast, especially the ash tree. The big, you know, the Journal Science has reported this. It's happening all over the world. Even in my own neighborhood, these trees are dying. Just one of the little plagues that comes along. At work, we have ash trees. They're dying. All over England, Australia, Africa. These great forests are coming apart. The times they are changing. Iran condemns the U.S. for their nuclear test. They did a nuclear test? 
I didn't hear that on CN, known as Pollux, the Nevada National Security Site, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Sandia National Laboratories, on Wednesday did the 27th. Hmm, didn't even hear about the first 26. Subcritical experiment conducted to ensure Washington can support a safe, secure, and effective stockpile. Or, as we said in our rumor and blog, maybe they're testing the weapon to use on Christmas Day in Phoenix. Maybe. You never know with these people. And then, of course, we're politically incorrect here. I don't know if anyone noticed that. If you need therapy, go get it. But I was just looking at my Yahoo mail, and they had one of these little, you know, votes. And what do you think about Canada's gun control laws back in, uh, you know, December 6th, the anniversary of our day that we'll live in infamy? And what surprised me is that most people have absolutely no idea what our gun control laws are in the first place, but, you know, do you like or don't like the yada, yada, yada. So at the time I voted, it was 54% uh, of the people said they were too weak. I bet you 100% of those don't even know what they are. And then 46% of them said they were too strong. We obstruct law-abiding citizens rather than criminals. See, when I was small, we had a lot of easy things, you know. We didn't need, like, you know, reams and reams and reams and reams and reams of laws like robbery was illegal you went to jail for life breaking into houses rape murder you know you pick all your major indictable offenses you know you're going away for life you didn't need all these little small technicalities whether I used a knife or you know I did this I did that I did that you're gone people in sh if, if Toronto had like you know 10 or 12 homicides in a year that was a crisis sometimes it's a good weekend now One of the things I really liked about when they brought in a lot of these laws was the fact that they banned the smallest, least accurate, and least powerful guns. Made them prohibited weapons, like the 25 caliber, 32 caliber pistols. And I always used to just marvel at that, because I was working at the armored car company then, and you know, you're carrying bags of money and you can get robbed, and a lot of times people were shot. I, have a, I know a lot of people were shot, a lot of them. And they were shot with those little 25s and 32s. And you know what? They're all alive today. Because as a round, it's a pipsqueak. It's like, you know, it's like this big or something like that, right? And then the infamous Mark Lapine goes in with a bullet like that's this long. Fourteen people killed. And he had a license. They gave him the license. And they always said all the time, like, just say, you know, I just go to the pilot school, right? Can I have a pilot's license? Yeah, here you go. Thanks. And then, you know, I go to the airport. Right? Can I rent that plane? Yeah, sure. I see your license. There it is. Oh, okay. There you go. Here's the keys. Have fun. Knock yourself out. Okay. And I crash into a schoolyard and kill everybody. Is that Cessna's fault? Somebody gave me the license. Who gave me the license? It was the RCMP. They gave me the license. So why did they give him a license? They knew he was a nut. They knew he was thrown out of the army for psychiatric reasons and stuff like that. Why'd they give him the license? Because he was a Manchurian candidate. Just like this guy Bain said in his analysis of 9-11. It was a programmed massacre to initiate a response where we come begging to say, do this, do this, do this, save us. And they sit back in their satanic castles and go, ah, we got another one on them. We're conditioned to this. One of the sad parts for women is they condition you to be the perpetual victim cowering in fear. Like, assume the position. Oh, don't beat me, Massa. Don't beat me. I don't need no more weapons. There's an old saying in politics, an armed man is a citizen, an unarmed man is a subject. And now women can vote. So an armed person is a citizen, an unarmed person is a subject. And that don't mean a lot. And it was a nice bullwhip for sale at the liquidator store, and I forgot to buy it. Because when they come and go whipping you, it's the subject that has to get down and beg and grovel. The citizen goes, <coughs> that's a big difference. They don't teach you that in school either, right? They probably don't teach you much. They don't even teach you how to put the pen on paper, as we said last week. So we're condition women to accept this inferior role. I'd say, uh, you know, 
it's just a damn shame we didn't have one of those 14 girls had a concealed carry permit. We'd have one less mass murderer in Canada. He never would have got started or he got his balls shot off afterwards. But your Manchurian thing wouldn't be as much fun. So they had a shooting in the States a couple days ago, shopping mall. People started to turn right away. They trained the police now, counterattack instantly. It's like I said for years. So these guys are cowards. As long as they got you taped to the floor, they're all heroes. When it's coming back at them a little bit, they fall apart like a broken chair with a big heavy guy on it. <coughs> Just like that. We'll be showing you a video documentary about that that's 56 seconds long or however long it is. And a monkey does it. And you see all the big girly man soldiers like Olympics? Who needs the Olympics, man? I, I did the 100 yard dash in two seconds flat. So why do we want our girls to be perpetual cowering in fear vassals of the state? Because that's what we have planned for everybody. As you will become subjects, not citizens. That's why it was in the Bill of Rights way back when. Two kings put it in there in a row, eh? So that's the most important right you have. Don't ever lose it. There's nothing we can do after we're dead. We consecutively made sure in our lifetime. The Americans were smart. They wrote it down. We didn't. In the United States, this is why propaganda is so effective, but back in the day, like 1870 to 1905 or so, the homicide rate in the United States from all causes was the same as Prince Edward Island, like 0 0.7 to 1.2 per 100,000. You get the movies and the propaganda to tell you you got the Wild West and all these shootouts and all that kind of... Like maybe over the course of 50 years, you had 12 or 15 famous shootouts with the famous cowboy heroes or something over a period of many, many long years, like a generation or two and pushing three. It's all hype for many long Powerful reasons. One is they didn't use psychotropic medicines. Two, everybody was armed, so if you ever tried any, you didn't tip your hat to a lady, you'd probably be picking your teeth up off the ground. <laughs> you think you're going to pull out a pistol? You didn't say, excuse me, ma'am. You just, well, nowadays in the malls, they just swear at women. Boom! Some lumberjack's just going to pound you one. Your head's just going to go poof, split like the Red Sea. Broken nose, all my teeth are gone, and I think I'm going to pass out in one-tenth of a millisecond. And then there's ladies like my grandma with the brick in her purse, and the hat pin was a classic. It's like, it was like the size of a ballpoint pen. <coughs> oh, was that your ribs, son? <coughs> Too bad. You were polite, really polite. So we'll show our uh, social justice experiment here. Find that one quickly. Which one's this? Kennedy? Hollywood. Oh, yes, here we go. Will this fly here? Oh, no. Is that like a problem or something? Hmm. Guess I'm going to need a Google page or something. What does that say? They take it down or something? I'm the guy with the bad eyes. Oh, okay. Well, let me see here. Is this your search engine here? Well, it's, a, it's got 26 million views. we got to find a few copies. Okay, and where's videos on this? Right there. Okay. You can? Well, I'll say it. it's 25 million views. It's got to be everywhere, man. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Well, he just told me to reduce the uh, the stuff there, and it'll come alive. <laughs> Boy, I hope, hope we got something better for Kennedy. You're going to play it over there? Okay, you play it over there. But notice how it says 20th Century Fox Research Library. Uh, 
Ah. Well, he's cooking now. Okay. Well, you see how that little uh, gaffer there has got never given up going back into it. He knows how to use it, let me tell you. Okay, he's popping them rounds out. 30 round banana clip. Look at them guys go. Boom, over the furniture, duck and cover. Did you get the victory sign on him? Because when he's finished, of course, he raises both arms up on the big... You can see it now. It's on the big screen, Janina, if you're, you're looking, but keep turning your head away. Don't look at that one. That'll curve your spine. But uh, it, it's just hilarious. The little gaffer just, you know, look at that. I won. That's the most important. Now, he's a primate, okay? He understands everything about what those kings put in. Can you put that up as a freeze frame? Uh? Okay. See, look at my little friend there. Hey, he knows. Look at that. I won. All the soldiers ran away. He understands. Just like Chairman Mao's axiom. That power grows out of the barrel of a gun. That's why they want to take them all, so they can have the power, and you got to grovel on the ground. Peace through superior firepower. There's an old saying in back in the in the day, way back in those Wild West days. God created man, Colt made them equal. See, in those days, women were burned as witches. When's the last time you saw a woman burned as a witch? <whistles> Probably a long time ago. Before your lifetime, before your mother's lifetime, before your grandmother's lifetime. And you know why? They invented the repeating firearm. When was the last time you were hauled off to the Inquisition for torture? Well, not since those two kings put that in the Bill of Rights back in, you know, way back in the English Civil War days. Like, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Right on. The monkey figured that out in two seconds. I win. And if anybody else figured it out, See, the whole concept of the modern state goes that they have a monopoly on deadly force. So did Hitler, Hirohito, Comrade Stalin, Comrade Mao, all the devious bastard kings and queens. They had a monopoly on deadly force. See, if you're like in the United States where you can have a concealed carry permit or possess a firearm to defend your life, Remember the video we showed you a few months back where the old lady's getting held up in the store, she pulls out her pistol, and there's like four guys trying to go through the door frame at the same time? <coughs> Except you're in Canada or something. We had a police commissioner, you know, we had a bakery. What was his name? Norm Gardner? Yeah, Norm Gardner. He was a police commissioner. Had a concealed carry permit. Because, you know, the cops are trying to get money out of him all the time for raises and stuff. He liked coming to the range to shoot and all that. So the chief gave him a concealed carry permit. Which is a one that's apples and oranges, right? He had it. Why? How? There's only about ten or twelve issued in Canada anyway, probably to politicians and kiss ass bastards. So he had one. Guy comes in to rob his bakery up at uh, you know, Bathurst and Lawrence. And it's like, okay, take the money, get out of here. Norm's working in the back somewhere. So then the guy starts roughing up one of the ladies at the counter. Nice sweet old Italian lady. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. You're not cutting her up with a knife. Sorry. Norm comes storming out of the back with his glockenspiel. Boom! Puts one through the guy's thigh. Mm. Okay, I'll let her live. No problem. Complete change around, just like the monkey. Figured it out right away. I'll be good. There's a classic comedy routine. Sister Mary Elephant. Cheech and Chong. We gotta find that one day to play on the show or something. Sister Mary Elephant. She's fantastic. Class! Class! And it's just like bedlam in the background. Class! They're tearing the place apart, screaming, yelling, swearing, whatever they're doing. Class! And she pulls out her piece. Boom! The next one's going through your kneecap. Instant obedience. Charm school. Divinity school. Everybody listens. We're ready. See? The monkey figured that out. 20th Century Fox Research Library. 
They're doing like a big mind experiment. The monkey figured it out. What's wrong with you? 49 men died on Mark Lapine Day, December the 6th. Nobody gives a rat's ass about them. They're guys. Like, you know, who needs them? And you couldn't use their stories for propaganda purposes because they were fishermen. They go in the ocean in those little boats and they catch the fish so you can have food to eat. What do you need them for? Wiped out all the males in two Newfie villages. All the fathers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, you know, brothers, cousins, whatever. Anything of a male relation. Gone between probably like 10 and 12 and too old to know where your false teeth are. Nothing was done. Nothing. There's no eulogies, no memorials. So wipe the hands clean of them. So there's no propaganda value. This story, propaganda value, made, designed, massacre for the New World Order to make you come begging to give away your freedom and your rights so we can ultimately enslave you and not just make the woman go cower in fear. Please, Mr. Obergruppenfuhrer, police, protect me all the time. But the men will have to join her down there Will they come stomping in. One of today's stories in the Toronto Sun is, you know, like the OPP lost five guns, drugs, and money out of their, uh, you know, property rooms and all that stuff. They make $70 an hour. It's kind of hard, like, to do the arithmetic to add all that up. Okay, I make $70 an hour. I work $40 a week. Uh, I made two hours overtime. I went to court that day. Okay, I gave this much to my broker. I got this much for my RRSP. I got to buy my Porsche. And I need some drugs, so I'll just take some from the property room. And then I sold this drug dealer a gun, and uh, I lie in court, and I do this. And then, oh, yeah, i got to sign up for the G20 so I can beat the shit out of some helpless women and pretend that I'll be their protector when the time comes. And, oh, well, this is a complicated life. you got to be kidding me. We pay 70 fuck bucks an hour to liars, cheats, thieves, and bullies? There's something wrong with this picture. seriously wrong with this picture. But to tell you the truth, like if we believe in privatization and stuff like that, screw the garbage contract. I could probably get four good Chinese cops for every one of them. They'd make seventeen fifty an hour. They know how to march real well. They got nice uniforms, cleanly pressed and all that kind of stuff. All look good. So, you know, save millions. And double the size of the police force. Oh, never mind millions, probably billions. Hmm. Well, that's probably where the end road is for that anyway. Yummy, yummy, yummy. But that's just the, the whole style of what we get from the new world order. But we do all kinds of bizarre and funky things here. This is what I did long before I came to that channel. Something that was just never reported. I was just reading the news, you know. We know things happened in Iceland for finances and whatever, so I'm looking up some stuff about Iceland. I go, you know, there's a Russian boat sink, people missing, they got a naval task force off the coast, and the Rush or, uh, or the uh, Icelandic Coast Guard is pulling in some empty lifeboats, three specifically. And I'm like, oh boy, we're in for it now. Because, I don't know, I guess we don't teach geography in school either, because if you can't put a piece of pen on a piece of paper and draw or anything, how the hell are you ever going to know where Iceland is? Like, it's kind of between, like, Newfoundland and England, somewhere in the middle under Greenland, so, you know, it's kind of in the middle, right? Russia don't have a big military anymore. They only have one place to go where they launch the nuclear weapons. They go to Iceland. And you know why? Russians like this one. It's the two-for-one special. I get Paris and I get New York with one boat. That's why they go to Iceland. It's not for the fish. They got fish in Russia. They sat outside the 12-mile limit, sailed around in circles. People in Iceland are going, oh, boy. I think we're in for it. But, of course, none of this gets reported on, you know, like those CNN shows or whatever, because people would probably change the channel because of Iceland? Who gives a shit about Iceland? I'm going to Jeopardy. And they're massing their fleet there to blow us to smithereens. When did that happen? That happened at a very important time. There was a president of the United States going to the Republican National Convention in New York City. 
his name was George Bush. But he wasn't doing so well because he was like starting wars and taking away people's rights and all that kind of stuff. So the first day was kind of tough. The second day, he's strutting like a peacock. And you know why? Because he had the best land school massacre. And we had to go fight those damn Islamic terrorists. And if you guys listen to me, well, the world would be a different place. I'd probably be the Antichrist. Oh, no, he didn't say that. But that's what he was going to do anyway. So the Speaker of the Russian House addresses Parliament, and he says a foreign intelligence service did it. So you got to wonder, who's going to go pee in their cornflakes and get away with it? There's only one country on the planet Earth could do that. It's not Botswana. It's the United States. They're the only ones who could go into Russia's sandbox and just let one rip and get away with it because they know, oh, Jesus, man, I can give them 10,000 nukes, but they're going to give me 10,000 back and we get wiped out and I haven't built my bomb shelters in Moscow. They started building them after that, you know, so now everybody can go underground. But it was a tense time, a really tense time. Canada got hit. We sent a submarine. Don't ever buy a second-hand submarine. This is the Russian task force, Task Force One, with the Admiral Kuznetsov leading the fray, heading to Iceland. But at the time, our submarine, HMCS Chakutami, was leaving England. We came out of the, you know, the Queen's U submarine store, and we were bringing her home. We were kind of sailing along this way. And all of a sudden, like, there was this big, funny fire. And I remember reading in the Globe and Mail, you know, the guy's talking about these balls of lightning flying down the companionways. And I'm going like, okay, I've seen a lot of fires. A lot of fires. A lot of different places, chemicals, this, that. Never seen balls of lightning coming out of a fire until I learned about harp and those types of weapons. So the big play is a little bit, like, to the up and left a little further from where that little pink bubble is where Chikudami caught fire. I think they hit her with a scalar weapon. And I don't think she was alone. There was lots of things getting hit with scalar weapons. This is a picture on the way to the body shop. So seemingly she was just in a fire, but there's a lot of body damage here from something. You know, I don't know, hit a whale or a piece of ice or something like that. It's hard to say, but it was a bad time. Because one of the Russians' big ships, the battle cruiser Peter the Great, exploded, caught fire. It's a nuclear reactor in there, eh? So even back in early March, long before this all started to pan out, the Russian press was talking about that the reactor was in such bad condition it could explode at any moment. Ba-boom! Five dead Russian solar sailors. The task force was having a bit of a problem. Nothing was ever said in any of the popular media. I wrote our Minister of Defense. I even got answers back from the Department of National Defense. You see, there's something in the middle of the Atlantic we call Standing Force Atlantic because somehow people at NATO figured out that that's where the Russians go to launch. So there's always a task force there 24-7, 365, all the time. So Canada, in its infinite wisdom, dropped out of Standing Force Atlantic, and because you drop out, you don't get the intelligence that goes with it. So we bring a submarine, and we're going to cross the Atlantic <laughs> right through the startup of World War III, and nobody tells us, right, because we didn't pay. So then somebody at the Department of National Defense figured out, holy shit, an HMCS Build of Quebec sailed out to join Standing Force Atlantic, and we paid our dues instantly. But it was a rough time, a very rough time. The stories in Iceland were bizarre. At the National Theater, an actress is on the stage, touches a pole, and just gets fried, right al burned alive right on the stage. <coughs> Crispy critter falls to the ground. Solveig Arna Dutter. The theater caught fire and burned. Horses were dying of anthrax. 5.5 earthquake in January. The ships went home by then. A volcano erupted. The northern lights got extremely bright. There was reports of mysterious lights in the sky. We saw some of those off Norway later. A flu outbreak. The fishing trawler Velour caught fire. The American biotech company Zytos opened up shop. The ship Jokofell foundered. And then there was another 5.2. So 
So 2005 got off with a bang in Iceland. And there's like one of those little anomalies there. So there's the, uh, the big uh, northern light or harp beam and the volcano erupting on the same time. And then in the United States, the Congress passed the Doomsday Bill. Continuity of government. And then the most bizarre thing at the beginning, before you know it really got horny, it was like one of the most amazing rescues at sea that ever happened probably in human history. It was, it was after this was over, I was just trying to find some stuff. There's dead links, so I'm looking for more information so I can have uh, you know my, my backup material and all this sort of thing. So then I come across a story in Stars and Stripes, that's the American military newspaper, about this rescue. And I went like, you can make a movie about this. Except it's all classified. But we're close to classified. So a sailor on a Russian ship called the Admiral Chabanenko had something happen to him. He was in bad shape. He's 230 miles away from Iceland. He's on the operating table cut open. And they're working on him for whatever reason. The Americans sent two helicopters through heavy seas and storms. And they sent two because they didn't think both of them were going to get there. So it was worth risking the lives of four or five guys on one helicopter to get this guy and bring him back for whatever reason that they never told us. It took two and a half hours to fly there. They had to refuel mid-flight. And then when they go on this ship, you got to remember, the waves are probably like going up to the bridge here. So you got 50, 60, 80-foot waves. Ships peeking back and forth like, you know, you're losing your cookies with, uh, with every roll there. So they got to grab this guy off the operating table throw him on a gurney, take him up to the, to the deck, which is probably a trick in its own right to go through some of those small hatches, throw him in one of those little baskets, and then the helicopter's still hovering over top. <coughs> Wheel him up, fly him back. Why? It's got to be a good one. I don't know why. Nobody's ever going to tell you. But like I say, that was a rescue that was just so bizarre, it's worthy of a book or a movie or both. No, because the news can't tell you. It's a giant intelligence operation anyway. What are the other few things they can't tell us? One of the other big ones is Bible prophecy, and a lot of things in Scripture talks about, the, you know, the, the water's turning red. This is Moses parting the Red Sea, so the water's not exactly turning red uh, as we forecast, but in many places here, the water is turning red. This is the Yangtze River in China in September. Nice red color. This one's in Beirut. This is the Australian coast. I think this was the south of France or Spain or something like that. August 10th. They always have nice explanations for all this. This is off India. Here's a little bird here, you know, in the Australian set. Don't be, you know, left behind, eh? It's a sign of the times. The waters turn red like blood. But the most important thing is, though, it has to be the Nile. Exodus 7, 17. With the staff that is my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile, and it will be turned into blood. So that's the most important one. Revelation 8.8, 8, something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea turned into blood. So I don't know if we've done the full third, but we got a lot. Then Revelation 11.6, men have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the times they are prophesying. Power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. <coughs> well, we do that. We do that with weather warfare. We can make it rain, we can turn off the rain. Most of these events were made by man. They turned the waters into red, like blood. And with our chemtrails, we can spread that all over the world, anytime we want. Al Gore invests millions to make billions in cap-and-trade software. Al Gore's venture capital firm has invested six million in a software company that stands to make billions of dollars from cap-and-trade. Gee, I thought he wanted to do it for the environment. Now well, I find out he's a whore. Gore lied about his profiteering from cap-and-trade to Representative Marsha Blackburn, 
Republican Tennessee, at the House Energy and Environmental Subcommittee during testimony in April. Hara Software sells software to help track greenhouse gas emissions. The market for such software is now about $2.5 billion in size, expected to grow by a factor of 10 to $25 billion if cap-and-trade legislation is enacted. Gore is also f under fire for lying to Representative Steve Scalise, Republican Louisiana, at the same congressional hearing about his relationship with Goldman Sachs. Who? Me? Goldman Sachs? Stealth cap and trade will make the vast majority of Americans poorer and less free, but Al Gore, Kleiner Perkins, Amit Chatterjee, and Hara will be laughing all the way to the bank. It's brilliant, and we fall for it every time. And then this story, how the U.S. election was planned to go and how the plan came unglued. So on election night, Karl Rove knew something had gone terribly wrong. Fox News called the key battleground state of Ohio for President Obama sealing his election. Karl Rove began building a case against the call his employer network had just made. He started to complain to Fox. He called him. He said 74% of the vote showing Obama with a lead of roughly 30,000 votes, 70,000, or pardon me, 77 percent reporting Ohio Secretary of State office that President's lead had been slashed to uh, just 991 votes. This was exactly like a spin-off from 2004 when this shift happened and Ohio went Republican. So in a book called uh, Boss Rove, journalist Craig Unger talks about smart tech and how it's drenched in Republican politics. So there's a company, smart tech in Chattanooga, Tennessee, that gets the spill off from these votes. And it happened before. And as soon as the votes are transferred, automatically, in those days, they turned Republican. And the swing state swung. That happened in uh, previous elections. In the present election, these votes were supposed to go to Mitt Romney. Butler, Claremont, Warren counties provided more than Bush's entire Ohio victory margin of 119,000, 911 backwards. But when the servers came back up, the votes didn't flip. Obama's lead still held. Carl Rove and Mitt Romney watched in slack-jawed amazement because they fixed the voting machines. Should have been a landslide victory for Mitt Romney. Rove was generally shocked. So what happens is Anonymous issued a video statement against Carl Rove. Anonymous warned Carl Rove that he's being watched. W quote, we know that you will attempt to rig the election of Mitt Romney to your favor. We will watch as your merry band of conspirators try to achieve this overthrow of the United States government. Anonymous is watching and monitoring all your servers. We want you to know that we are watching you, waiting for you to make this mistake of thinking you can rig the election in your favor. If we catch you, we will turn over all of this data to the appropriate officials in hopes that you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. As if that's going to happen. Two days after the election, Anonymous released a press statement claiming it did prevent the attempt of Rove to steal the election from Mitt Romney. Digital structure of Rove's operation involves something called ORCA. This is uh, something the Republican people use to find out uh, the equivalent of exit polls. But it's far more than that. It has nothing to do with getting the vote out or checking anything. It's part of vote rigging. We coded and created what we call the Great Oz, a targeted password-protected firewall that we tested and refined over the weeks. We placed this code on more than one of the digital tunnel destinations that Rove had. So that's what Anonymous did. They c took control of the digital tunnels that they were going to pass information from and block them. So as these guys kept trying to do what they could, you know, to rig it, to swing it, it wouldn't work time and time again. Brilliant brilliant. It's not news, though. You should never know about them fixing elections. And the reason why the Democrats will never do anything about it, too, is because they've got vote rigging companies and machines on their side at certain key places, too. So you can't spill the beans because they're just as dirty in certain respects. But in this instance, Anonymous 
grab girls by the shirt and curlies and just turned them upside down. It's beautiful. Then it turns out this David Petraeus is also a guy who was bankrolled or hoping to be bankrolled by Rupert Murdoch to run for president. So he was very keen on getting him under his hooks. Very keen. So in a way, we're glad he's out. The big story around the world, unfortunately, as it's probably a psyops, is a story about the Australian DJs getting information about Kate at the King Edward VII Hospital. The nurse who transferred the call allegedly committed suicide. There's some things that are really bizarre about this is the fact that they had an inquest within days. That just doesn't happen. Been a, like you got to gather evidence and stuff. It takes months, months to prepare for an inquest. You just don't do it. Oh, let's do it tomorrow. I got nothing to do. Yeah, here's a note. She committed suicide. Yeah, the autopsy results will be in two weeks from now. Find that hard to believe. And three letters, like, you know, they're really making it stick, right? So the hospital says they didn't discipline her over the incident. But in the news report, it says they weren't believed to be disciplining. I can guarantee you they were going to hang her by the heels. International embarrassment that she let these people get in and, and you know, basically phone touch the princess to be? Eh. Not going to happen. What probably happened is the union was telling her she has a disciplinary interview and that she's going to be let go. And she just lost it, came apart. Maybe she killed herself. Maybe they did it for her. It's difficult to say. These DJs, uh, you know, are basically in hiding now. There's uh, people say that they have bullets with their names on them in Australia. And the poor woman who, uh, who died in this is, you know, mega victim. Perhaps she knew something that no one's supposed to know. And that's why, you know, they took her out. It's hard to say. When they interviewed her family, her name is Jacinta Saldana, they were shocked. They were also shocked that the husband never told them that she committed suicide. And then the British press now, a lot of the family are clamoring to find out, like, what the hell happened? Well, how could you have the inquest? You don't even invite the family exactly to come in and uh, see what's going on. It's just, you know, carpet comes up, dirt gets put underneath, carpet goes down. So is the truth maybe that the princess was choking on those reptile scales? Is David Icke right? Who knows? One of the biggest things that's going to be, you know, probably not too useful in the near future, like in a couple of weeks, or, you know, anything to do with Mayan elders or anything like that. Like, you're, nobody's going to hire a Mayan elder anymore to come to a speaking event. A whole bunch of them went to the UN lately to talk about the Golden Dawn and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, a lot of books on Mayan prophecies will be used for firewood and be at yard sales for, you know, 10 for a penny or something like that, because we're probably not going down the tubes. Although, if you want to go and blow it all before uh, it's too late, there's a little tiny village in the French mountains in the Pyrenees called Bugarich with a population of 176 that is the only place the cultists and doomsday prophesiers say will survive. So they're charging you uh, one and a half euros a gram for stones. Local spring water is 15 euros. The camping space is 324 euros, and it's 1,600 euros a night, or pardon me, dollars a night. Oh, there's a bargain. Let's go to that place uh, to stay and, uh, you know, watch the world come to an end. So our Mayan calendar, because it was so long, 5,125 years, like, you know, the guy who put it together probably goes, well, you know, I'll just let my great, 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 10,000 times more. Grandson finished the rest. Lazy shit. He didn't go to school and learn how to pick up the mallet and carve into stone to make another one. I'm going to slap him when he comes to heaven. I don't have to worry if I'm wrong because we won't be here to talk about it anyway. But 
there is, uh, you know, a very, very big economic tsunami on the horizon. I guess I better load this down. These pictures are big. And so is the trouble we're in. It's big, really big. Let's get our money down even further yet here. Look at how big that is. Okay, so we got a hundred dollar bill up there, and then there's a little pack of ten thousand. So we kind of put that into perspective there to give you some idea of the, the size, right? So this is a million. And then on a pallet, you got a hundred million. Close down there. Then we get to the next size. Ten pallets is a billion. So there's a billion. There's the big guy and you know all that kind of stuff. Just give you some idea of you know you're gonna hurt your back picking that up. Let me tell you. When I worked in the armor car industry, we used forklifts to move big stuff. It wasn't no billions, but we used forklifts to move stuff before we did the mains. So there's uh, you know, like 20 of those things on a transport truck to give you the size of a transport truck. And there's 10 billion. And there's a trillion, okay? So we'll start at the bottom, and we got to go up this little tower here. That's a trillion in $100 bills. <laughs> Probably don't need a vault, because nobody's going to pick that up. Okay, so that just gives you a little bit of perspective of, you know, what a trillion dollars is, because, you know, you probably carry that much in your wallet, or you got it in your piggy bank all the time. And it's just so big, you don't even think about it. It's like the World Trade Center in height, right? And there's like a whole whack of people. 3,500 people and a hundred million pallet. So all these people have to work for a year to see a stack of one million for 35 average Americans or the hundred million for the 3,500 people. So you see that little one, right? That's just the one. So we were way up here, you know, with our little pallet with the one million so that's how long that's how many guys you need like a little army there just for one of those things I remember how big that building was too right so here's one bank it's called State Street Financial their derivative exposure is 1.39 trillion dollars so there's their big corporate office and then when we pile up all those hundred dollar bills we almost got like the Twin Towers coming up there that's their derivative exposure not too bad, eh? Now, you got to remember, these guys are on the light end. And then we go to Morgan Stanley. Here's Morgan Stanley down here. They're in for $1.722 trillion. So they got another twin tower coming up here really fast. There's their nice corporate office there, and they're trillions of dollars in $100 bills. Wells Fargo's in for $3.332 trillion. Wells Fargo's corporate office. Yeah, look at this. It's almost like the Twin Towers. Just made out of money. We're getting close. Not too bad there. But we're still not at the high end. Then we go to HSBC. They got a triple towers, and we're working on a fourth. They're in for $4.321 trillion. Just look at it. Can you imagine the hernia you're going to get trying to lift all that money? Could you imagine somebody goes up to you and says, I'm going to give you $4.321 trillion. You just got to lift it. Oh! God, that hurts. Arnie, take me to the gym, buddy. Then we go further along the trio, and we go to uh, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is in for $44.192 trillion. Nice building there. Oh, shit, who's that? Oh, the Statue of Liberty. Look at that, it's a football field. Look at that, four towers now, and we're working on a fifth one. Not too bad. That's just Goldman Sachs. I wonder what the Bank of America's up to. Fifty point one three five trillion. Ooh, look at that. That's some like real money. That you know, American greenbacks. Two football fields. And a big bank tower. Look at all those towers, man. So we're still not at the top. We gotta go to Citibank. That's how much we're in foreign derivatives at Citibank. 52.102 trillion. I'll just be happy with the 
oh, oh, two trillion. What do you think? Here we go. Oh, oh, two trillion. We can handle that. We could probably fit it on that truck and just, you know, drive it around town, spread it all over. Then we get to the real big trouble here. J.P. Morgan Chase. $70.151 trillion. Man, those printing presses are going to have to work over time. Over time. So in total, the total derivative exposure is $228.72 trillion. That's the whole enchilada right there in $100 bills. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. There's the White House down there just to give a token. If one of those falls over, like, you know, El Presidente's dead, they don't have to wait for the DNA virus to get them. So when that goes, that's three times the world's GNP. Gone. There's no way anybody or anything can make up that the algorithm will work. Will be wiped out. So now you know why the queen was checking out her gold. A wise old woman. Probably seen some of this before in her life. Canada is you know, sending our bank governor to the Bank of England. He's a Goldman Sachs boy. Bilderberg Group man. 13 years at Goldman Sachs, New York, London, Tokyo, Toronto. Goldman Sachs has been accused of defrauding customers. 1990s, when he worked for the bank, Goldman played a two-faced role in act advising investors to buy Russian bonds before Russia tanked. In the Japanese branch, where mothers would tell their sons, no one goes and works in the banks, it's bad. They scraped the bottom of the barrel for those guys, but, you know, he was in there. And he's a Bilderberger, so at the last Bilderberg meeting, he was right in there with uh, British Finance Minister George Osborne, another big Bilderberger. And birds of a feather flock together. IRS loses challenge to prove tax liability. Internal Revenue Service lost a lawyer's challenge in front of a jury to prove a constitutional foundation for the nation's income tax. Tom Cryer told World Net Daily. This is the biggest fraud backed by intimidation and extortion and by sheer force of taking the people's property and hard-earned money without any lawful authorization whatsoever. It's going to hire me a monkey. The free exchange of labor for compensation has been upheld as a right by the Supreme Court, but doesn't necessarily make the compensation income. Oh, fine print. Gotta hate that. Those dirty lawyers. And then something really weird. CEO Tom Cook says Apple will build some Macs in the U.S. next year. Jobs coming back to America? That can't be true. It must He must be on one of those, like, you know, wild cocaine parties or something and just kind of, like, flipped out, or maybe they're just going to make one or two, you know, just for monkeys to use and so they don't have those AKs to overthrow governments or something like that. Osborne's going to raise tax on middle-class workers into the 40% tax rate because ultimately it comes from you. You're the lender of last resort. You're going to pay for all these mistakes. It is inevitable. Loblaws, a big chain here in Canada from one of these you know, massive multi-corporations, has done something that is just absolutely brilliant, really. They created a real estate investment trust. So they divided Loblaws into two parts. The stores can go bankrupt, but the trust is separate from the stores. So they'll save the land. The real estate will have some value after the collapse. Their stock went up massively. Galen Weston, the executive chairman, says it will build long-term value for Loblaw and the new company REIT. He probably is talking to the queen and might have some gold buried under there too. Another big chain that owns another big supermarket uh, company here in Canada called Sobeys, they started doing this in 2006. Really smart. And what do we do this for? Because this global economy is evil, really. In a surprise raid of a sweatshop in India, a group of children were forced to make Christmas decorations, some as young as eight years old. They live in a room approximately six feet by six feet and are forced to work 19 hours a day making the decorations sold to cheap stores in the United States and probably other parts of the world. The Global March for Children was involved with former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who must be a decent guy and maybe not a pedophile because you don't hear too much about him, with the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education. 
14 children were freed. They lived in a dingy basement without air, without food, without proper care, being forced into child labor for all the hours of the day. It's too bad they didn't have a pet monkey with an AK-47 just to even the score a tiny little bit. Let's see, maybe we can get another video to uh, pop here. We can do a little uh, review of a movie if it's still around. Oh, I guess all my things are frying here. Pollywood? You got Pollywood. Show me the little blurb on uh, Pollywood so we can show people this nice Pollywood documentary short. A few seconds long and give them something to, to root for. Politics, for better or worse, is tied to the television camera. Everybody has to put on a good image, whether it's a real image or not. They've had to become actors themselves. They have to play the media. If I do have a skill or a credential, it's being able to communicate to people. You guys think that you speak for us. You do not. A lot of people think that celebrity advocacy is just another way of getting your name in the paper. That's actually the last thing in the world that I'm here for. CNN will have just as many Hollywood celebrities on as they do political figures. Now the target is ratings. It is simply ratings. It's all theater. I think that the camera made the big difference. It's very hard to wipe images out of your head. They get in there. We are about this far away from the political version of Miss America. Okay, so we hope you enjoyed that little blurb, and it encourages you to try to get a hold of Hollywood and start to learn a little bit about, you know, what really goes on behind the scenes and how you're taking advantage of Six Ways from Sunday, because that's the whole point, the whole message we try to convey here is to teach you how to survive, right? We teach a man how to fish, he fishes for life. We teach you how to recognize and discern information. You do that for your life, and you do it on your own. You don't need to do it for you, because you'll start to see through the illusions. It's all an illusion. One of the big illusions is the drug companies. So this article, How Drug Company Money is Undermining Science, not that that's a big surprise to a lot of you, but a scathing expose in Scientific American, says the pharmaceutical industry is funneling money to prominent research scientists conducting studies on their own products and no one, not the researchers nor the funding sources, not scientific institutions and not even the government appears to be able or willing to stop it. It's probably because the money comes in on one of those trucks with those pallets because they sell so much. I don't know if they make trillions but they're definitely doing hundreds of billions so you know you can get a good sized truck to carry enough pallets to make that discernible for uh, the powers to be to profit from this kind of crime. They come up with just tons of money for travel, for this, hiring ghost writers, you know, pretty much buying any kind of academic. You know, they said you could buy a, a reporter for so much in the days, uh, back in the Washington Post days. Well, I guess, a, you know, a scientist or something like that is probably even cheaper than uh, these hookers or whatever. But when they do come up with something that doesn't work, like one of them was Avandia, the diabetes drug that killed tens of thousands of people and significantly increased the, res or, uh, the risk of heart attack and stroke. Tens of thousands of people. Tens of thousands of people. So let's say I let out all the prisoners in the Toronto jail system and give them a handgun and tell them to go wild. Free me, man. Do whatever you want. They'd probably have a hard time killing tens of thousands of people. As you see in the movie we have posted on our website there about, uh, you know, the good old days in the war. Uh, let's see if I can get that up there uh, quickly so I can refresh my memory. But I did it for uh, Conspiracy Night at the Movies. And they just show about this massacre. It's called Massacre in Rome. Maybe we put that one. Yeah, there we go. Conspiracy Night at the Movies, Massacre at Rome. Classic old movie. That's why you got to come here. Look at all the stuff we get for you. You know, it's, it's 1973. A lot of you weren't born then. And, you know, so that's how I know you're really young is when I drove cars that have, you know, birthdays older than you. But they took all these Italians because somebody whacked some German Gestapo guys, so they had a 10 for 1 ratio. 33 Germans were killed, so they killed 330 Italians. At the end of the movie, they show the honor roll, and a lot of them were Italian soldiers, a lot of them were Jews, a lot of lawyers. Well, I guess it sucks to be them. And, uh, you know, even a Carabinieri brigadier. They're all taken into these caves and blown away. There was a lot of work 
Like they had to organize all these trucks. They had 74 or something German soldiers with Mauser pistols to line all these guys up five at a time and blow them away and take turns and get rid of the bodies. It took them a long time. It's a lot of work. Very good movie. Exceptional movie. Try to get another one for you. That's uh, just as spectacular. The Scarlet and the Black. So you have something to watch again for the weekend. But it took a long time, a lot of work to kill them. And that was the army, the Gestapo, the SS. So these drug companies here, with one drug, just one, thousands of people, or pardon me, tens of thousands, never mind that, killed by this drug. So you figure they'd be in some kind of trouble. They'd ban it, ban it. Could you imagine you kill tens of thousands of people with a small concealable handgun? The world would turn on its axis. Nothing happened. The drug is still approved for use. Is there any pallet here yet? I want to go to Switzerland and check my gold. Oh, oh, the helicopters are coming. Guess we're in trouble. So what's some of the good things you can have? Found this article from tomb to table. Cumin's health benefits rediscovered. This is like the miracle cure for a lot of things. A lot of people in the old days use it like we use pepper. It's good for your blood sugar lowers it. So if you're stuck in a day and you need this stuff and you know, it's kind of like it hits the fan and you can't get anything else and you're diabetic, you might want to have some of that handy in your little bug out kit. Maybe it'll keep you alive. Bacterial infections. Human oil has anti-MRSA properties. Ooh, lots of people die from that. Tens of thousands just in one country. Candida yeast infections, cataracts, cancers. Oh, gee, and I wanted to die from cancer. Dental plaque, foodborne pathogens, immune function, fertility, memory disorders. Oh, I forgot what I said. Oh, I'll get some cumin. Morphine dependence, osteoporosis, thrombosis. All in one little spice. No wonder Marco Polo walked across the continent. Vitamin C reduces pain and inflammation. Yowza, yowza, yowza. What are they trying to do? put these drug companies out of business. And then Prince Charles was at one of these functions where they look after the soldiers and, you know, pat him on the back and whatever, says he doesn't know where his son is in Afghanistan. Well, I thought he was the colonel like every regiment. You can't trust the prince to tell him where your son is in Afghanistan. So I found that as a weird story. So at the same time, they get all the big busty chicks to come out, you know, and say, come on, boys, join up, get your balls shot off, and then you'll never know what to do with those things. Yeah, 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 I'll do it, I'll do it. Everybody's lined up, get your medals, get this, get that. But he doesn't know where his son is. Of course, the son he has over there is the one with that red hair that nobody else has, Harry. So you're wondering if, uh, you know, maybe they're just, like, it's the setup for the kill. We don't need it anymore because Kate's going to have a kid. And, you know, you just watch Harry kind of fall off into the background somewhere as he falls out of his helicopter. You never know with them. But one of the good news stories is Sally Nightingale, the wife of the SAS hero Danny, the guy that, you know, they were trying to nail on some gun charge or something like that. Well, they, things are working out with him. So he's not the bad dude anymore. The state of Michigan passes a bill so far for the NDAA, the NDAA nullification bill to say, up yours. We don't like it. Good men. And then I guess we can show a quick book. This was mailed to me uh, before. Did you get a chance to talk about it? Oil, the fourth renewable resource. We talk about the truth about the oil industry and such like that. Very nice to get this little book to tell you the other story. And, of course, I imagine it's available all over online, so you can read it yourself or find it at the library and learn about, you know, the truth. I'll write up a little bit of something on it for the gentleman and help him along that's what we need, the truth. What are some of the truths? The odds of dying in a terrorist attack. You are 13 times more likely to die in a railway accident than a terrorist attack. You are 12,571 times more likely to die from cancer than a terrorist attack. You are six times more likely to die from hot weather than a terrorist attack. You are eight times more likely to die from an accidental electrocution than a terrorist attack. Tell that to the opera singer in Reykjavik. You are 11,000 times more likely to die in an airplane accident than a terrorist plot involving an airplane. You are 87 times more likely to drown than die 
in a terrorist attack. You are 404 times more likely to die in a fall than a terrorist attack. You are 17,600 times more likely to die from heart disease than from a terrorist attack. You are 1,048 times more likely to die in a car accident than a terrorist attack. You are 12 times more likely to die from accidental suffocation in bed than a terrorist attack. You are nine times more likely to choke to death on your own vomit than die in a terrorist attack. You are eight times more likely to be killed by a police officer than a terrorist attack. So you better start making some more police state laws so that you can die in a terrorist attack. Are you heading for the exit? Okay, Hugh's nodding his head. He wants to head for the exit. What I'll do is I was going to show uh, the little video of Kennedy talking about the conspiracy, but what I'll probably do is it's already on the website posted in, uh, it starts out in another documentary. I might just put it up there as a little vignette so you can hear the late, great President Kennedy he wrote a TV guide all about how they manipulate us and control us in 1959 and how he talked about the conspiracy and what the conspiracy is, how dangerous it is. He told the truth. He got shot in the head by his own people, more than likely. Turns out there was even a secret plan to nuke China and Russia if the president died or went missing for whatever reason. We may have come that close to that even. Maybe the mad dogs were even trying to destroy the world, never mind kill the president. How deep, how great are the holes, the conspiracies? They're all over. And there's only one place where you can get some really good information. That's Conspiracy Cafe here on that channel, our last show for the year. Hopefully, maybe not our last show forever, but we never know how things will pan out in the future. We expect to be alive and thrive December 22nd and into the new year in 2013. Always come to these websites, thatchannel.com, conspiracy-cafe.com.net.org to find out how to safeguard your assets, your life, your property, and everything else around you. We appreciate you. That's why we come here. Hugh's done a marvelous job tonight. Aaron's always done a marvelous job. We bring you the best. And we'll be signing off, signy die, or until same that time, same that channel next time. But we'll be here to the end. Good night. I'm with you now.